On a certain Monday morning on July 2nd, 1787, a vote was set to take place. The country had been torn apart on the issue of representation, and with no states willing to back down, it appeared that this new and bustling country was in a state of far more discord than they had originally hoped. In particular, the state of Maryland had been a key reason that compromise had not been reached, and intense bickering and opposition had become the norm on voting days, with neither side able to gain the majority needed to achieve a compromise. Thus, on this day, when delegates from each state were set to vote on a solution that had little potential to satisfy both crowds, there was not much hope that an agreement would be reached. The issue had become increasingly irreparable, and with each failed vote, it seemed that the country was one step closer to succession. However, on this fateful day, as delegates got together to begin the voting process, one empty seat lined the table for the Maryland delegation. The seat would remain empty until the vote had concluded, and with this, a long-standing gridlock had been broken, as a compromise was finally decided to move forward with just one extra vote. According to historical records written at the convention, the empty seat had belonged to Daniel of St. Thomas Jennifer, who would arrive right after the vote had taken place. He had been a firm adversary of the compromise proposed, and no records show exactly why or how he missed such an important meeting. As we look back at a decision that changed the scope of American politics, we might conclude that it was simply the case of a missed alarm. But if we take a deeper look at the situation at hand, Perhaps it was an intentional decision that would lead to unforeseen consequences for America as we know it today. Four years after the United States had won its independence from Great Britain, a slew of economic and political troubles would follow the ratification of the Articles of Confederation, as fears of an oppressive and overwhelmingly powerful federal government led to an unequal distribution of power among the state and national levels. Unable to act or make key decisions due to a dependence on state approval, it became more and more evident that a change would have to take place to save a country being plagued by severe economic burdens. Uh, the United States had, by then, its first constitution and its first federal government. Articles of Confederation, the Continental or Confederation Congress, contemporaries called it just Congress. It turned out to be extraordinarily weak. It was unable to raise taxes. It was unable to enforce law, and some thought it had no enforcement power. However, states were initially hesitant to give power back to the central government, and the impetus for a final decision would end up being the radical political movement known as Shays' Rebellion, which was a series of violent attacks on courthouses and other government properties in Massachusetts. This event would display in full the weakness of the federal government to suppress uprising and disorder, and it also brought about a sense of fear for the upper class and political leaders in regards to the dangers posed by the American people themselves. As such, a decision was made to amend the Articles of Confederation, with states providing delegates to discuss the matter. From this, the Constitutional Convention of 1787 was decided upon, and it was seen as a last hope to restore order to a nation that was growing weaker and weaker in the face of internal and external troubles. We don't have the United States yet, but we won a war. And after that, like a certain uh, colonies based on their own states, they uh, try to do their own business. So there, there are a lot of issues. Immediately, several debates dominated the proceedings to create a stronger national government. But chief among these was the dispute involving representation between the small and large states. If you are the state of Maryland, which is dwarfed by Virginia, the largest of the states, which is your, your northern neighbor, uh, then, then you really face a precarious situation. You're concerned about your local government being swallowed up by these larger governments. In particular, two separate plans helped distinguish both sides during the debates, with the Virginia plan calling for apportionment by population and the New Jersey plan proposed by William Patterson of New Jersey calling for equal representation. Another delegate, Oliver Ellsworth of Connecticut, witnessed the disorder that was forming within the convention and pushed the need for compromise. To satisfy both crowds, he proposed that if the lower house of the national legislature is elected on the national principle, the upper house should be elected on the federal principle. This proposal received minor support at first, but eventually, with both sides clearly not willing to accept the full terms of the other, there was enough discussion to bring the topic of compromise to a vote. 
with perhaps the fiercest divide among the states present, Maryland had become known as an important swing state, with delegates consistently voting opposite towards one another on the issue of representation. One of these delegates, Luther Martin, was a violently strong supporter of equal representation in Congress, and he firmly supported the Ellsworth Compromise, recognizing that it would strengthen the position of states with smaller populations. The other, Daniel of St. Thomas Jennifer, held different political views. As a firm supporter of a government on behalf of the people, he would always vote for the big states, opposing Martin's vote and establishing a stalemate that would stall the passing of any real compromise. All the attendees of the convention knew that since a small group of candidates, including Jennifer, were dead set against equality of representation, the compromise would almost certainly be voted down. The situation seemed dire, and it fell on one fateful day to reach an agreement to avoid the possibility of permanent adjournment, which had settled in as the most likely possibility. However, on that very morning where history was about to take place, something was clearly wrong. Largely, uh, Jennifer had been neutralizing and balancing off Martin in the votes through much of June. So there was a lot of divided voting coming out of uh, Maryland. But on this occasion, um, Luther Martin is there alone. Jennifer does not show up. And he's missed almost no sessions prior to this. And more tellingly, he arrives moments after the vote is cast. Now, what is the vote? Maryland is allowed to join the five voting in favor of equal representation. Whereas before, just a few days before, on a slightly differently tailored vote, Maryland was divided. Divided because Jennifer canceled out Martin. So it is conjectured and it is widely supposed in the scholarship that this was a deliberate action on the part of Jennifer. When we take a closer look at the situation, from historical records, it is evident that Jennifer had been a firm supporter of the American side before the revolution had even occurred, and the prospect of a strong and united national government appeared to be his greatest concern as voiced by fellow delegates. At the age of 64, he was exceedingly well respected and could be described as always in good humor. According to voting records, he had been present for nearly every session and voted on every major matter, and he had a set opinion regarding representation that he was not likely to change. So, on such an important day, with such an important matter at hand, is it possible that his failure to arrive on time did not have deeper implications? Regardless, by chance or by intention, Daniel of St. Thomas Jennifer would rewrite the history books that day. As an unlikely hero in a small group of individuals who prioritized opinion over the unity of the country, he ushered in a decision with monumental consequences in itself. Even if he's a nationalist, right? He, he, he more, I mean, he, he's not like an extremist. He say, no matter is equally, is it represented by state or is represented by proportion, he put a federal government, put a nation above all. In fact, by potentially sacrificing his voice for his country, Jennifer would allow the committee to move forward in his plan to create a new constitution. Without a proper agreement among the states, a near-permanent gridlock would have been established that would oppose a significant barrier to the passing of the Constitution, possibly delaying it for several months, years, or maybe not at all. If this were to have occurred, it is likely that America might have been split into two regions, North and South, and the landscape for which the United States was born would have been torn apart politically and economically. In terms of the actual decision's influence on legislative affairs today, we can attribute to it the foundation of the system of congressional representation that we utilize today as it has influenced everything from money bills starting in the House to the way votes are counted in the Electoral College during presidential elections. So, whether Daniel of St. Thomas Jennifer did so intentionally or by accident, when we take a look back at a defining moment in American history, one thing is for certain. The decision of an everyday man was a deciding factor in a compromise that would shape the country of America as we know it today.